Good morning, Cedar Park. You don't look sweaty at all. (laughs) You do look one hour more rested than you looked last Sunday. True? It's been 16 months since I've had the the opportunity to be up front here. And uh, man, I've been saving up all this material that I I, I wanna dump on you this morning. So we're gonna need that extra hour. JK, as the kids say. (laughs) Did you notice, I certainly did, driving over this morning, all the Halloween displays seem to still be up in the neighborhood. Uh, Is it just me, or is Halloween getting out of control? Uh, I I was thinking about that as I was awakened at 3 o'clock in the morning on Halloween night. It sounded like a war zone outside like just fireworks exploding. It sounded like right out our window, just boom, boom, boom. The -the over-the-top costumes, the the creepy house displays that are getting more extravagant every year, the all-night fireworks, it just seems that our society is getting more and more attached (laughs) to Halloween. A recent Huff poll concluded that 45% believe in ghosts, the undead, and supernatural spirits. In the UK, Paul Challoner, more people believe in ghosts than in God. You notice all the films that represent supernatural elements. It seems, people I talk to, and looking at our culture, more people believe than ever that there's a thin line between the unseen reality and the scene, between the the spiritual dimension and the things that we can taste and see in front of us. Why are we so fascinated by ghosts and the supernatural? Maybe it's because they poke at the unknown and they press our anxiety buttons about the meaning of life, death, and in between. Me, I love a ripping good ghost story. Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. Fantastic ghost story. So is Turn of the Screw by Henry James. I remember reading that in high school. It was terrifying. If you think about it, the Bible contains many occasions where the thin line between the natural and the supernatural is transversed. I'm thinking of the story of Balaam and the talking donkey. In November, in November, in Numbers 22, or the spooky hand that appeals that appears and begins to scribble on the palace wall in King Belshazzar's court. A few times in the Gospels, the disciples mistake Jesus for a ghost. Mary Magdalene sees the risen Jesus. She thinks she's seeing a ghost. Have you heard of the Holy Ghost? thought so. Have you heard of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Good, good. Uh, Because in some churches, their idea of the Trinity is the Father, Son, and Holy Bible. Okay, and I'm glad we're we're a Holy Spirit church here. The term Holy Ghost, right, it comes from Old English translations from the Latin Bible, Spiritus. The term refers to breath, to the life-giving power of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. However, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is a person as well as a spirit. And it teaches that he is equally God alongside the Father and the Son. Are you confused? Understandably, if you are. A century ago, Charles Spurgeon said it like this, the actions of the Holy Spirit are so secret, his works are so removed from everything that is familiar to our mind and body that I cannot easily grasp the idea of him being a person. But he is a person. God the Holy Spirit is not an influence, not an emanation, but he is is as much an actual person as either God the Son, or God the Father. B. 
Because of his mysterious ways, as Spurgeon says, I think the Holy Spirit is often overlooked and misunderstood in our teaching about the Christian life. And yet, he is so central to us, helping us hear, experience, and follow Jesus. That's what I want to talk about this morning. And I have to confess, I have a a holy fear of talking about the Holy Spirit this morning. I don't want to misrepresent him in any way. And so, would you pray with me as I ask for help as I speak this morning? Let's pray again. Father, Son, Spirit, help me speak accurately of your Spirit this morning. Although, Spirit, you are mysterious and powerful, you're good. You're good, and you awaken us to Jesus and empower us to live the supernatural Christian life. Spirit of the living God, we've already elevated and worshipped you this morning. We invite you now to speak to us in whatever way you would like us to better know Jesus and to better follow him. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart this morning, be pleasing to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Did you know that if you're a Christian here this morning, the action of the Holy Spirit was an essential ingredient in your salvation. Was and is an essential ingredient to your salvation. Before you ever invited Jesus into your life, it was the Holy Spirit who first awakened your interest in Jesus. Because, as we've been reminded, as we've been traveling through Ephesians the last month, We were dead, spiritually. We were dead. And when you're dead, there's not anything you can do in your deadly condition because you're dead. Now, I know things were pretty quiet in that casket that Pastor Chris dragged up here a few weeks ago. I've wondered ever since, where did he get that casket? (laughs) Like, did he get a deal on a used one or... Like, what was that about? I mean, I've heard about retirement planning, but that's next level. (laughs) But when the Holy Spirit awakens you in your deadened state, that's a miraculous event. We shouldn't forget that. And frequently, it's an unusual event. My friend Hayden was first blinded by the light of God when he was in a satanic bookstore in Los Angeles. And he had this momentary revelation when he was in that store that put him on a new path. And weeks later, he trusted Christ. And to hear him tell the tale, it's a holy ghost story. My wife Angie was deeply into transcendental meditation till one day in a first year medical school class, there was a professor talking about death and dying. And suddenly, suddenly Angie realized that she herself had no answer for the purpose and meaning of her life, much less her dying. That was a Holy Ghost moment for her in class. And in response, Angie began a spiritual search that led her to Jesus some days later. One more Holy Ghost story. My friend John was at the pinnacle of his professional life at age 42. And he was on a taxi tour with his wife in North Israel one afternoon. And his guide, who he found out later was a Messianic Jew, mentioned Jesus a few times as he pointed to the different landmarks in Galilee and referenced their significance to Jesus in the Bible. Now, John wasn't searching for God. He wasn't needy. He wasn't discontent unhappy with his life? No. In fact, he'd been to many church weddings and funerals here in Vancouver where he lives and heard the name of Jesus many times. But as he recounts that story, he says, I heard the word Jesus as if for the very first time. And something began to stir. And later that afternoon, he said to his wife, Maureen, something is happening in me. I don't, I don't understand this. 
but Jesus means something to me now. I need to search him out. He did. A few days later, he trusted in Christ. I love these Holy Ghost stories. And I'm sure you each have your own story, and probably more than one, about this mysterious spirit who awakens us. Tell you one more. In my ministry with the Navigators, I reach out to business leaders, people who have achieved worldly success. And yet, well before meeting me, often, the Holy Spirit has begun to work them over, get their attention. And I remember one time I was meeting with a man downtown, and he'd been taking a, a workplace alpha course, and uh, alone with him, I, I drew out the plan of salvation on a napkin. Uh, God over here, humanity over here, Jesus depicted as a cross in the middle, who is our bridge to God. He took the napkin, he said he'd think about it. A week later, we met again and he said, Tim, the most unusual thing has happened to me. My daughter, who's an artist in Montreal, sent me a painting for my birthday this past week and the painting depicted roughly what you had sketched out on the napkin, much more beautifully and elegantly, but he could see the picture of salvation on this beautiful painting his daughter had painted. To my knowledge, not a Christian. And he said to me, I, I think I want to become a Christian. I get it, I want it, I need it. And since then, Dave's wife has also come to faith uh, and, and the Spirit continues to work in his family. Now, that's what gives me the mojo in witnessing to people is that I know inside information, God the Spirit has already been working that person over long before I've come to meet them. So I just, I just try to figure out what God's doing in that life and bless it and land on it and develop it. The Spirit is the one who opens hearts and awakens us. I remember this scene vividly. I was sk skiing up at Whistler. And, you know, the hills are long at Whistler, and they regularly have these breaks in the pitches where you can kind of rest your quadriceps and, and recover yourself. And uh, I came to one such break, and I saw this huge map of the mountain up on the, just up there. And people were just kind of resting and looking, trying to identify where they were on the mountain, looking at this map. And I saw this, this woman on a, on a cell phone madly gesticulating at the map, it was clear that she couldn't get her bearings, like she was lost. And yet she was before the, maybe the biggest map in the Western world before her. And there were lots of friendly people around she could have reached out to. But she chose to talk to probably a trusted friend that could help her offer personal comfort and direction. And I sometimes think of this ginormous map and realize that even, even a map, even having the Bible, even ha having a helpful friend, isn't always enough for people spiritually. It's not enough. The Holy Spirit has to come along as a trusted friend and help us get our bearings and begin to move towards Jesus. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. And maybe you're here this morning and you feel a bit stranded, like that woman in the middle of the hill. Or maybe you're skiing through your life and you have intention, you have direction, like Angie or my friend John, and yet here you are. You know, we are a minority of people here in South Delta who are in church this morning when you could be doing a thousand other things on this autumn day. Why are you here? Probably multiple reasons related to friends and, and, and family, but you're also here because God, the Holy Spirit, has drawn you here. You're here to have your deepest longings addressed and satisfied. And like a trusted friend, the Holy Spirit has shown up as well, and through the worship and through this reflection, he's here to invite you to get closer to Jesus. He is the answer to your deepest longings. Now, followers of Jesus, 
like most of you and me, were likened as unto sheep who follow a shepherd. It's not the most complimentary uh, allegory in the Bible, where, yeah, any, any of you who know sheep, but I think it's a good one. And I wanted to just elucidate this morning one of my favorite verses. It's such a picture in uh, John 10, 27. And Jesus is speaking, and he says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And for the rest of my sermon here, I want to talk about the three dimensions. There are more, but three dimensions of this amazing statement. And how the Holy Spirit is deeply involved with us in this relationship with the shepherd. First, the Holy Spirit makes Jesus known to us. In Jesus' day, sheep were not primarily raised to be killed. They were tended for their wool. So a sheep would be in the flock for about nine years or so, and in those years, the shepherd would grow close to the sheep and vice versa. I didn't know this. Shepherds actually named each one of their sheep. I don't know what you would name a sheep. You know, woolly or marshmallow? I mean, that's an interesting internet search. But they would name their sheep, and the sheep would recognize the shepherd's voice and call. And so trust would develop between the sheep and the shepherd, and they would respond to the shepherd's direction and assurances. Now, in those days, every shepherd had a staff and a rod, and a rod was about half the, the length of a staff, and it was made from the root of a tree, and often there was a bulb on the end, so it served as a club to protect the sheep from predators, natural and human. And the rod, though, had another use, and at the end of the day, the, the shepherds would invite their sheep back to the, the fold where they would stay safe for the night. And as they went through the gate, the shepherd would lower his rod inches above the ground and the sheep would have to go under the rod one by one. And as they did, the shepherd could inspect the condition of the sheep and see if there are any injuries or ticks or whatever that the sheep had incurred through the day. It was very individual and very tender as the shepherd coaxed the sheep under the rod. Each sheep got individual and tender attention. Now, in my ghost story, the, the, the Holy Spirit changed my relationship with God to a, a religious arm's length relationship into a personal embrace. And like that woman who was lost on the hill at Whistler, I, could, I was a Christian, but I could never get my bearings. I believed I was a Christian, but I had no spiritual appetite, and there was no action in my life that you would have said was godly or Christian in any way. And I did see myself as a Christian, but as a disappointment to God, like a perennial underperformer. It wasn't until I was about 20 years old that I even learned about the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I went to one of those churches. <laughs> that was, you didn't talk about the Holy Spirit in polite company. He might split the church. And uh, I realized that my problem was I wasn't experiencing any joy, joy or power or peace as a Christian because I had not given God any room in my life. Arm's length. And... You know, a Christian who is unsurrendered to God is an unhappy person. And sad and desperate, and, and, and at the end of myself, I asked Jesus to assume the throne of my life. And Paul says in Romans chapter 5, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Well, that's what I needed. And I love this statement because it describes my Holy Ghost experience and that season of my life. And as I've uh, learned from that, I realize this sense of closeness with Christ is available to every Christian. 
in every season. And the Holy Spirit makes the love of Christ real to us in our experience, tenderly, personally, individually. And as I surrender myself to the Holy Spirit and to God for the very first time, age 20, I've been repeating that surrender ever since. Uh, Often daily, sometimes hourly. (laughs) Lord, retake the throne of my life. Fill me again with your spirit. It's a regular occurrence. We need to repeat this daily, hourly, minutely. Lord, retake the throne of my life. Fill me again with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, he's so close to us. He knows all about our weaknesses and fault lines. And I'm still a deeply flawed person. But instead of condemning me, like the enemy does, the Holy Spirit leads me to specific areas of my bondage, my problems, my sin, so that I can confess it, repent of it, and be free of it. Often as needed. And I remind you, the Holy Spirit is never discouraged with us. Because we do this often. You know, we get dirty as sheep. We need regular cleansing. But the Holy Spirit is never discouraged with us. You may be discouraged with you, but God is not. Instead, he regularly guides us to freedom, helps us discern right from wrong, wrong from right, puts us right back on the path. And in exchange for our surrender, he builds into us the character of Jesus Christ, the fruit of the Spirit. It's awesome. Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Now, the Holy Spirit is the one who makes the voice of God understood to us. And in this way, the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Now, get your arms ready. I have a a midterm quiz for you. Have you ever heard God speak to you? Raise your hand. Oh, that's good. That's encouraging. Have you, has God ever invited you to become a Christian? Raise your hand. Okay. Has God ever spoken to you through his word? Has God ever spoken to your heart through worship? Has God ever pointed out sins for which you need to seek forgiveness from God or from others? Okay. God ever brought people to your mind for prayer? All right, this is in a live church. I like it. That's what I thought. Well, if one or more of these experiences have happened to you, then God has spoken to you. Okay? So, Jesus claimed, my sheep hear my voice is true, isn't it? Yes? Amen? Amen. Yeah. So, we just need to remember that there are many, the Holy Spirit is very creative, and there are many ways in which God speaks to us. I've only heard an audible voice, which might have been your first thought when I said, has God spoken to you? I've only heard that once in 40 years of following Jesus. <laughs> More often, I, I, I hear by impressions or promptings. My wife Angie gets pictures and words of knowledge. And uh, I, I work with Iranian students, and I regularly ask them about their dream life. They're, they're, they're Muslims. I know that that's one of the ways the Holy Spirit speaks to Muslims, is through dreams. It's so cool. And sometimes they reveal to me that, yes, they, uh, God has spoken to them in dreams about this Christian Jesus. Other times, the Holy Spirit speaks to us by disturbing us in our comfort zone. I was leading an Alpha course a few years ago, and uh, a neighbor, Jerry, uh, was attending, and she was an atheist, and she was a self-appointed skeptic. And she was along an Alpha for the ride to make sure that her husband and her and anyone else in the room was not corrupted and, and uh, deceived by these Christians. However, she seemed to settle into the, the course as we went along, as people in Alpha do. She kept coming with her husband, who was a little bit more open than she was. And uh, one night we were watching a video on the Holy Spirit, and and Jerry slips out of the room and comes back in a few minutes later like she'd just seen a ghost. (laughs) 
And uh, when we had a break to talk, she said, the weirdest thing happened. When I was in the bathroom, I began speaking this gibberish. Did I just speak in tongues, she asked. Now, (laughs) soon after, Jerry trusted in Christ, and that experience had a lot to do with it. Now, by the way, I don't know if speaking in tongues fits with your theology. I have found that the Holy Spirit doesn't much care about the limits of my theology. (laughs) He operates by his own rules, which can be disturbing, blessedly disturbing. The point is that with God, there's endless creativity with his communication and us. I could relate more of these unusual Holy Ghost stories, but mostly the Spirit speaks to us through his word, the Bible. After all, he co-wrote the Bible with human authors. Paul says this in the New Testament, there's there's nothing like the written word for God showing you, the Holy Spirit showing you the way to salvation through Christ Jesus. Every part of scripture is God-breathed by the Holy Spirit and useful one way or the other, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. That's the the surest way to hear Jesus speak to you is to pick up your Bible and start reading, which is why many of us don't pick up the Bible and read. We're afraid he will speak to us. How do you detect the sound of God's own voice from our own busy mind as you read Scripture? Well, my suggestion would be just assume a posture of humble receptivity. In John 20, when Jesus meets his disciples after the resurrection, He breathes on them, and they receive the Holy Spirit. He didn't knock them over with a hurricane blast. He didn't, you know, he he breathed on them. It was an expression of intimacy. He didn't have to huff and puff and blow the house down. Why? Because they were receptive to his breath. And we need this posture of spiritual receptivity as well if if we want God to speak to us. So ask God, pick up your Bible, and before you read, just ask him to quiet your mind and speak to you as you read. Try reading a few verses and then stopping, going back and reflecting on the paragraph. And uh, I like to remind myself that I'm actually in the audience of God. I'm reading God's honest truth. What a privilege. And then I ask myself, is there a clear message in this text? And then I take... uh, a piece of paper and a pen and I write out a verse that I particularly resonate with that I think God might be giving me to to take with me that day and then I write a response to it so uh, this is what I wrote the other day I I'd read Psalm 150 and I, I do this every day but I thought this one I would share with you I wrote out verse 6 of Psalm 150 Carl you probably know the verse Let everything that breathes sing praises to the Lord. Praise the Lord. And that just seemed to catch me. So I read out the verse, reflected some more, thank God for it, and then I wrote an application. Lord, help make my praise to you as natural and reflexive as breathing. I want to lift you up audibly as I go about my day today. So I had something that I could take with me and the Spirit could work into my life that day. And I find writing out the verse in an application, like I said, gives me something to take and something to share with somebody else. And frequently I find the the verses that I hang on to for the day, I recycle them, like appropriately, in further conversations that I have with people through the day. It's really fun. Not forcing it, but... Coincidences happen when you're ready to share something from God's truth. Another thing, as you get to know the the God of the Bible, a clearer rule for the messages from the Spirit is that the Holy Spirit never calls us to do something that's inconsistent with his teaching in the rest of the Bible. And a good rule is that he, he always guides us to a place of abiding, a place of peace, with Jesus in his communication with us. Even if your world is upside down, fortunately, the Spirit um, communicates words of peace 
and strength and joy in the midst of the worst storms. As you read the scriptures, you find the Holy Spirit breathes upon you. And Paul says his word is near to you in our hearts, he says in Romans 10. So the intimacy with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit is available to us as we pick up our Bible and we read attentively and receptively. The result is that the shepherd is able to lead us in the path uh, to which we're to walk. Isaiah assures us in chapter 31, whether you turn to the right or the left, your ears will hear, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. What a promise to claim. Guidance. And this is the kind of divine assurance and guides I need every day. Don't you? That's amazing. One of the, one, once you get a hold of this, it changes everything. And it, we get it by making the Bible part of our daily routine. It used to be a duty for me. Then it became a delight reading the Bible every day. Now it's a, I'm desperate to hear God's word. I, I, I come in there broken. I need it. Uh, the Spirit speaks to me and I, I get... I get fixed up. What's our time like? Okay. Darren had a Holy Ghost moment and became a Christian about 20 years ago. And I've been coaching him ever since. And in all that time, I could not get him into the Bible. He's a busy executive, and he gave me all the usual excuses that people give me for not making space for God in his life. Sure, he made progress in the spiritual life, but it was glacial, really slow. I kept saying, Darren, give God some room in your life. Finally, he did. And uh, three years ago, he started to make time. And I I think it was a Holy Spirit, more than a prompting, it was a real push. And he began to make time for God to pray and listen. And now, when Darren talks about the Lord, he, he can't, like he starts to choke up, he becomes tearful. His relationship with God has moved from this arm's length to the tender embrace. It's so amazing. Recently, he sent me this email about the fruit of his daily time alone with God. He said, I cannot recall another one thing in my journey that has engaged me more than this and encouraged me to have ongoing conversations with God throughout the day after I read the Bible in the morning. That's a Holy Ghost story. That's very meaningful. Daily time in the Bible and prayer will keep you in range of God's voice. And exposure to the Scripture really increases the Holy Spirit's vocabulary in your life. It just gives Him more to work with. If you want to become, if you want to change more quickly, give God some room in your life like this. In John 10, 27, again, Jesus says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. That, that ought to be normative in every Christian's experience. And unfortunately, we don't have slides this morning. My fault. But to reiterate, what I've been saying is, one, the Holy Spirit makes Jesus known to us. Two, the Holy Spirit speaks to us, uh, um, to us clearly. And thirdly, the Holy Spirit helps us follow Jesus. The sum of our Christian experience really is a response to the initiative of the Holy Spirit. He does it, we we just keep saying yes. And what what, what does following Christ actually mean? What does it look like in your life? It's going to be different for each one of us. Uh, Frequently, as you know, it's not easy. But I wonder sometimes how many people's struggles in life are really their struggles with God. We resist being truthful. We resist God's leading in our life. We resist forgiveness. We resist trusting God to look after us. So we try to satisfy two masters in our experience. God and self. What what I want to (laughs) do. So life is stressful. We're conflicted. As we say, it's complicated. We struggle with the complexities because we avoid the simplicities. 
And may I say that I've learned many times when the Holy Spirit says don't, he really means, Tim, don't hurt yourself. And when I remember this, obedience becomes more accessible, more joyful, it becomes a freeing thing. It's actually sin that's self-limiting and self-destructive. Life simplifies when you surrender your agenda and make life about following Christ. But simple isn't always easy, right? However, when you follow Jesus, you can be confident that your problems are not your problems alone. They're his problems too. I, I love this pithy statement and promise in 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety on him, on God, because he cares for you. And Peter's declaring that we can be careless in the care of God. And looking back, yeah, I've had lots of dicey moments in following Christ, yet you might agree with me that as you look back on your life, God has a really good track record of faithfulness, of looking after your family and looking after you. So I think I'm saying that we can be as close to God as we choose to be. It won't happen by accident. You have to fight with your busy schedule, with your self-involvement, and make time for Him. So Alice Freiling says, transformation is something that happens to us, but does not happen without us. The Holy Spirit, she says, will not force His way into a new way of being. Jesus says, right? My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they choose to follow me. As we close, where are you at with this? Are you sensitive to the voice of the Spirit in your lives? Are you blessed with this rock-solid sense that Jesus knows you and there's a daily realness to your relationship with him? Are you responsive to Jesus' direction in your life? Where are you at? What are you going to do about it? I have a ways to go in this following the shepherd. Here's some good news for us, though. The Holy Spirit is with you and me in this. He is on the side of your best life. He's praying for you right now. He's the one who can help us live the Christian life as it's meant to live, be lived. My uh, creed occur to you is surrender. Ask him to take control of your life and continue to invite him into every dimension of your life. You can keep having it your way and resisting the Holy Spirit. You can do that. But until you surrender, I can forecast from my own experience that your Christian life will be frustrating, even disastrous. Because you're a sheep. You're not the shepherd. Ask the Holy Spirit to take control of your life so you can better hear the voice of God, enjoy Him, and follow Jesus. Talking about the Holy Spirit, we can, we can be led to think that it's all spectacular. Uh, it's much more daily than that. I love Mike Iaconelli's comment here. He says, I used to think the power of the Holy Spirit was reserved for the spectacular, for healing, for tongues, for deliverance. I think that the power of God is available for the little things, quote-unquote, like tongues and healing, but it's also available for the big things, like the power to say no to TV and the movies, the power to choose inconvenience, the power to admit my shortcomings and failures, the power to ask those I have wronged for forgiveness, the power to pray, the power to work at my relationship with my spouse, the power to find courage to do what I'm afraid to do, the power to live with temporarily not being liked by my children because I've said no, the power to listen. Do you need more of the Holy Spirit's power in your experience? I'm guessing you probably do. <laughs> I sure do. Join with me in prayer as we reflect on these things together. Let's turn our attention to our true companion, the counselor, the comforter, 
the Spirit of truth who is right there with us. My friends, what do you need from God today? Do you need to confess your sin that's been chewing you up? That might be the Holy Spirit asking you to confess it so that you can return to the joy of your salvation. Maybe you need a fresh reminder of God's love. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you with his love. Do you want to believe in Jesus, but you're holding back? Ask the Spirit to give you more faith. My friends, ask and receive. Seek and find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. Lord God, thank you, Holy Spirit, that you give us the life-giving breath of God. You awaken us, you hold us, you draw us nearer to Jesus with words and promptings as we try to follow by faith. Thank you for your great patience with us. Please don't let us go. For the glory of our Savior and King Jesus. Amen.